sir, are we on? Do we have sound? Excellent. Maybe. We'll wait and see. As long as it's showing up on the little audio meter, it should be. Should be, so we'll see what happens. Yes, no, maybe. We do have sound. Okay, that's a that's that's quite a lengthy delay. No, it was cutting in and out. Is it still cutting in and out? No. Oh, it might have been where I unplugged this. All right. Awesome. All righty. Well, it's a few minutes past seven. I can't really see that clock in the in the living room. Um, looks like what seven, eight, something like that. Nine minutes after something. Anyway. All right. So go ahead and turn to Second Timothy chapter two, and uh, we're almost. To the end of the uh, evangelism training or ambassadorship training, whatever you want to call it, I can't even decide. So, on Facebook, I post them as evangelism training. On YouTube, I think I'm a, I have them as ambassadorship. So, anyway, <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy. Chapter 4. So this is lesson 9 on the videos, but it's actually la lesson 7 on the uh, the paperwork that we have. And uh, I've mentioned before, and I'll mention again in case anybody watches this a little bit later on, even not just now, but later on, um, I'd, I will send you the PDF versions of the documents that we've been using going through. If you just send me an email at Greg Reeser, that's R E S O R, at crossworkministries.org, and uh, I'll send those to you as soon as you, as soon as you let me know. Um, so, if you have the papers with you, whether printed off or PDF on some form of electronic media, lesson seven is where we're going to be in the paperwork, but this is video nine. Which actually, I figured we'd probably end up with 16 videos since it's eight and we usually take a lot longer, so we'll see what happens. All right. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter four. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start reading, and I'm gonna read the first five verses of Second Timothy chapter four, and then, and then we'll get started. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Dear God, Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. As we come to the closing part of the evangelism, tra evangelism training, may we, may we keep in mind the things that we've studied so far, and know that we're ambassadors and evangelists. Uh, that we're ambassadors for you, that we're actually representing you while we're here on this earth. And our goal is to be lined up with your goal, and that is that you want all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And we know that that first part is something that's very near and dear to your heart, that it's your will that all men be saved, and that we might be able to be some sort of part in, in producing in our lives your will that we're either doing one of those two things. But Father, as we prepare ourselves to go out into the world with this message, may we come to a better understanding of exactly 
how your word works through us to allow us the opportunity to, to do the work of an evangelist. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, when we come down here to 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul, of course, is talking to Timothy, who is a young pastor. And you see in verse 2, he's talking about <clears throat> preach the word, be instant in season, out of, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And, and he gets down to verse 5. And he says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Now, when we first started um, a few weeks ago, when we first started going through this, one of the things that we were talking about is what are, what are the top three reasons of why people don't evangelize. The, the, the main one was that we're too frightened to. The second one was, I don't know what to say. The third one was, it's the pastor's job. And so then somebody will quote this verse in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and say, see, Paul is talking to a, to a pastor and he says, do the work of an evangelist. But when we take a look and we know and understand that our whole deal, go, go over to real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, our whole deal is not just the fact that we're to be evangelizing, but there's a whole different thing that we have going on that people in, the, in, in times past did not have. Um, when we take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, notice we're going to drop down to, let's drop down to verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And we've mentioned this before, and this is one of the reasons why we wanted to make sure that we know and understand what's going on here. If we've been given a ministry or the ministry of reconciliation, if we've, given, if we've been given that particular ministry as members of the church of the body of Christ, then that's what we're supposed to be doing. And that's what we're doing right here. And we're preparing people not just to evangelize, but to be able to take this ministry of reconciliation out to the world. Notice. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. When we take a look at, at what we're supposed to be doing, this is the great commission for the church, the body of Christ. The great commission that everybody always talks about is, go ye into all the world, Back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when, when we take a look at that information that was given to the nation of Israel, they had stipulations that they first had to start off in Jerusalem and then Judea, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, a little bit later on in the first part of Acts, it goes from uh, to, to Jerusalem, to Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the world. Well, they had, they had a pattern in which they had to start off at Jerusalem, and once they got everybody in Jerusalem saved, then they could go to Judah and get everybody in Judah saved, and then unto Samaria, and get them, and then go out to the rest of the world. Well, the thing that's going on back there is Jesus Christ tells them, You've not, you won't be able to go all throughout Jerusalem before I come back. So then they cannot fulfill that commission that Jesus Christ gave them until he comes back. So then we already know that that's not our commission. Well, then we want to find out what is our commission. What are we to do as members of the church of the body of Christ? And right here it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us or for us or by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. What we're to do is take the, the ministry of reconciliation. We need to know what that reconciliation is about, first of all. And then to know, to know the fact that we have a ministry that we're supposed to be a part of. And we're supposed to go to the world and say, you need to be reconciled to God. And the way that you're going to do that is what we're doing here. So that's one reason why I can't make up my mind. Do I want to make this evangelism training or do I want to make it ambassadorship training? Because they're both basically the same. The only difference is, is ambassador is your position right now on earth. And what we're to do is go evangelize. Get people to, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and then come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, a lot of times, most, most of us, and I'm, 
I'm guilty of this as well. A lot of times what we do is we try to bring them unto the knowledge of the truth before we even know if they're saved or not. And so when we take a look and we go down through here, as ambassadors, one of the things that we've been asked to do or called upon to do is to engage all lost people with the gospel. Now, as we go through the, the paperwork here, the, the information that we have, we either have, people are either one of three things to us at any one particular time. Um, people might be scenery, you know. Um, I, Delilah and I, we've talked about this before, I love to people watch. I love to sit back on a bench or something like that with Dr. Pepper or water or Mountain Dew, some form of that, um, some drink of some kind, nothing hard or anything like that. Strawberry lemonade is also good. But I just sit back and watch. I just like to watch people. Um, you know, some of us, we might think of people as obstacles. You know, somebody's in your way and you got to walk around them or somebody, you know, in your job. This person's in my way and I can't get promoted because this person. Our cat's been gone for hours and then she shows up as soon as we start. Um, <clears throat> another thing that people, we might see them not only just scenery is, you know, some sort of landscape of our life. Um, but another way that we'll see them is machinery. You know, if you take a look, you see somebody that, that brings you coffee or comes in and gets your order for food or whatever it may be and somebody's um, doing something uh, for you or, or to help you out. Um, or is just a person, just a real person who may or may not be lost. And if we start thinking of those folks that instead of thinking of them just as machinery or scenery and just understand that they're people and there's some sort of relationship that we might possibly have with those people, um, if we start thinking of, of, of situations that way, one of the toughest things is to get people who are churched to come to an understanding of God's Word, right, and the divided, because it goes against everything that they've been told, and then there's in the back of the mind, well, what else have I been told wrong about my entire life? Well, the easiest thing to do is to get people who are unsaved, who are unchurched, get them saved, and then they're going to want you to teach them about the Bible, because you're the one that actually brought it to them. Um, in the work of evangelism, one of the things that we have to do is in, to, to get to the point where we can break through those barriers to where it's not just people as scenery or machinery or, or just somebody that we know, but we're, we're called or thought or we're, we're asked to engage all people as if they are, are lost uh, to do that. And that's what we're supposed to do is do the work of the ministry. Um, one of the things that I will I will mention, and a lot of people disagree with this or whatever it may be, but God doesn't orchestrate you walking through your life and meeting somebody and presenting them the gospel. Um, no matter how hard we pray for it, no matter how hard we think that that's what God's doing, God's not orchestrating our life. We don't go to some restaurant <clears throat> and end up having a conversation with somebody about their eternal life because God's directed that in some fashion. It's we take the opportunities that we're, that we're given as we move out through life. It's not some divine appointment that God before ordained. I mean, that's so Calvinistic, and a lot of people think that way. I mean, there's even grace folks that I know that think that way um, that should know better. But as we go through, the deliberate, the deliberate presentation and, and, and seeking to have that opportunity to get people to understand that eternal life is something that, you know, it's not just we don't live here and, and we die and then life's over. You know, there's something after that. So what we're wanting to do tonight is um, get an idea of how to farm, right? So we're going to start off with a definition of a farm. So a farm is a list of people that we have some sort of relationship with that 
we might be able to that they might be able to benefit from evangelism or some instructional or spiritual concern that 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 uh, that we can give them. All right. So when we start talking about how to farm, well, first of all, we need to understand what it is to farm. So a farm is just a group of people that we have, a list of people. And you'll notice in the packet, if you've got it, right after this, there's this paper right here. I'll cover up my face for a second. You can't read that. However, what it is is it's a, it's a farming paper is basically what it is. It just gives you an opportunity to, to write down names and addresses and phone numbers and things like that. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that here here in just a few minutes. But the farming issue is just, you know, when you go and when you go and sow a seed, and that's exactly what we're doing here, you know, Paul talks about the fact that one, you know, some water, some, some plant, some water, but God giveth the increase. So some of us might be planting seeds, some of us might be watering seeds that other people's planted, but God's the one that's going to give the increase. So as we go through here, we have to understand that when we when when you go and plant corn, well, what do you expect to get out of that? You don't expect to get soybeans. Um you expect to get corn, right? <clears throat> and so a lot of times I think Christian, if you want to call it that, churches, whatever you want to call churchianity, Christianity, whatever it is, you got a group of people that think a church building is is where it's at. They they try to figure out, well, why is so-and-so backslidden, okay? And they get into this whole thing, well, why did they backslide? And they got into this sin and that sin, and they're starting to do this and, and all this other stuff. Well, the problem is, is you're expecting corn and you planted soybean. You're not actually presenting the gospel correctly and you get a false confession or a false profession, I should say. You get a false profession of people believing that they're saved when they're not. And then you wonder why they're off doing whatever they're going to be doing. The seed, what we plant, is the, is the, is the key, making sure that we get that. Now, some of our some of our prospects that we're going to be able to include in our farm. Some of them might just be cold market prospects. You know, strangers that we meet. Um, this happens. You know, how many times do you sit next to a person and don't speak to them? You know, that's a possibility that you might have to present the gospel to somebody that you're never going to see them again. All right, so it's a stranger, somebody that you don't know. Uh, that would be a cold market prospect. A warm market prospect is somebody that you might know, so such as relatives, uh, family members, especially you know extended families, friends, coworkers, neighbors, babysitters, um, people that get you know do your hair. My the one that does the one that cuts my hair is right here, and I already know that she's. She said, but I mean, you know, you think of all the things of, of, of the relationships that you already have. <clears throat> the goal is to take those cold market prospects and move them into the part of being warm market prospects. So it's not just, hey, how do you do? You know, let me tell you about eternal life. It's not just that, but it's getting a relationship with that person. Now, if you're at an airport and you're sitting next to somebody and they're, you know, they're getting ready to fly to California and you're flying home to Kentucky or wherever it may be, you're never going to see that person again. So there's not an opportunity to, to at that particular time, get them in, into that and bring them over. However, that is something that, you know, if you give them information, say you can contact me anytime, then you could develop a relationship with that person. But <clears throat> that's one of the things we can, we can look at. Um, <clears throat> Second part, now that we know what it is, the definition of a farm, let's take a look at how to develop a farm. Um, one of the ways is, is just to use your existing networks that you already have, whether it's relatives or associations that you may have, friends and families, things like that. Uh, folks that have been referred to you, hey, you know, I don't know if so-and-so is saved, but you might want to have a talk with them, you know, something like that. Get, getting an opportunity to be able to talk to somebody, getting, getting some people on that cold list, that cold market list, 
and developing some sort of relationship with them and bring them over into that warm warm market list. Everybody that you meet <clears throat> wants to be loved and respected. Everybody wants to be accepted and treated like a friend. And if we repeatedly reach out through personal concern and touch the people we want to lead to Christ, it builds a bond between us. It's going to make it easier for them to accept us and the message that we have, right? And getting to a point where we can actually develop that farming system. Uh, don't be impatient. That, that's one of the toughest things. Me and, me and a bunch of other people, we've talked about this before. Becoming impatient is one of the toughest things to overcome. But eventually you can uh, through, through the help of the Holy Spirit. As His Word, as God's Word works in and through you, he, you will develop the ability to do that. But don't become discouraged either. You know, if you talk to somebody three, four, or five times, everybody always quotes Paul when he says after the third admonition, let them go. But that's tough because you can get discouraged very quickly on things like that. But persistence. Now, if it's something where somebody says, if you don't get out of my face with that, I'll punch you or something like that, that might be a completely different issue that uh, you might want to let them go. Um, one of the main things is remember to always do good. Go get Galatians chapter 6 real quick. We'll take a look at this. Look at a couple verses here. Galatians chapter six, verse ten. Now I'll tell you one thing that I that I've kind of understood recently. Years ago, growing up, you weren't supposed to talk about religion or politics, and that seems like that's what everybody talks about, and nobody talks about anything else other than those two things. One of the things that I, I kind of see happening, it seems like some people lose the opportunity to present the gospel to others because of maybe their political slant or even their religious slant. You know, somebody comes along and says, well, I don't want any of that religion stuff. And then you say, well, I don't, I'm not all about religion. This is something different. And then you start quoting some of the other things that religion does. Then, of course, they're going to be turned off. But... Notice Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So when we take a look at this, and this is right on the heels of where Paul is talking about the idea about God's not mocked, whatever you sow, you reap. Whatever you do in life, you're going to get it back. Well, what happens when you sow something? Well, you reap it. It's always later. It's not right after. And then, you know, this whole thing, people talk about karma. Well, that's karma. Because you're driving down the road and you didn't present the gospel to somebody and your tire goes flat and then you run off the side of the road, whatever it may be. People say, well, that's karma. That's not karma. That's not what that stuff is at all. But what you sow, you're going to reap. And if you sow good, you're going to reap good. And it's always going to be later. It's not going to be right after that. It's always going to be later. And it's always going to be more. You know, you can go plant one row of corn, and you're going to get a lot of corn out of that. Now, of course, it depends on how long that row is and all that stuff. But, I mean, if you go plant one, if you go plant one seed, one thing for corn, you're probably going to get three, four, five Ears of corn depends on all that. You're probably going to get three times more, four times more. It depends on what kind of corn it is and all that stuff. But you're always going to get more, and it's always going to be later. You know, there's there's a there's a there's a sowing time of the season, and there's a harvest time of the season. And keeping that in mind as we go through. But here's the here's the issue. Is he says, as we have therefore opportunity. Let us do good unto all men, not just people that agree with us politically, not just people that agree with us spiritually or socially, whatever it may be, but to all men. But he goes on and says, especially them who are of the household of faith. So if we have opportunity to do good unto people, 
that's great, but especially if we have the opportunity with people of the household of faith. Go get 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 15 verse 15 see that none render evil for evil unto any man but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men now as you go down through here you have this is a function of the body this is something that you through the spirit through the intake of proper and sound doctrine you can build up into your soul the ability to do this through the scriptures actually understanding what the verses say and who you are and be able to live that out and you can actually make this become a function of your body that you're not just good to and as he says both among yourselves so again it's those folks who are of the faith and to all men again it's not just limited to certain people that we have some sort of information or connection to it's all men go to Titus chapter 2 <clears throat> Titus chapter 2 look in verse 11 we'll start off in verse 11 Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God it bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and, might, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, notice, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Now as we go down through here, it's God who worked through us to make it possible for us to be zealous of good works. We want to be able to do good unto people. Notice, drop down to chapter 3. <clears throat> verse 7. We'll start off in verse 7. <clears throat> Paul says that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, if you take a look at that, justified by His grace, that's the same thing that we saw down here in chapter 2, verse 11, that that same grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. He says that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will, that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto all, unto men. Now, as we go down through here, we understand what, what Titus is doing and, and Paul setting up a church through Titus and Titus is going through and, and starting a church and all that. But one of the things as we go down through here is he's saying, be careful to maintain good works. Well, the way that we do that is through all that information that we just got to read in chapter 2. And again, it's just God's Word working through us and in us and through us to be able to do that. But it's to maintain good works. And it's not, again, we know that you're saved by grace through faith and we know that you're going to be preserved and you're, you're preserved until the day of, of Christ. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a down payment, right? And we know that we're going to be saved. There's nothing that we can do, say, think, feel, whatever to, to turn us over away from God. We already know that. And as we get down through here, doing good works isn't, a, isn't something to say, well, I'm going to, be, I'm going to be able to remain saved or I'm going to continue to be saved because I do good works. It's just, a, it's just a natural thing that's going to come out as the Word works through you. So how are some of the things that we can do good unto others? Well, one might be to invite a friend to a dinner, a picnic, bowling, tennis, invite them to church, take them out golfing, disc golfing, even better, birthday parties, uh, vacation Bible schools if, if your local assembly has one. Um, any opportunity that you can, you can invite somebody somewhere and give them the opportunity to hear the gospel. Um, another way would be to offer transportation. 
You know, if, if a friend of yours has a vehicle that's in the shop, ask them if you could take them and pick up their vehicle or, or do you need a ride back, especially if you work with somebody. Uh, provide a meal for a person when, when they're sick or there's a death in the family. That'll give you an opportunity to be able to present the gospel. Uh, babysitting for people, cleaning houses for people, uh, take care of their pets while they're gone, mow the lawn for people, um, helping us any sort of financial need that might arise. Any of those things are going to give you an opportunity to share the gospel with that person. Um, another way would be to send a card, birthdays, anniversaries, thanksgivings, if there's a death in the family, get well, congratulate for some sort of accomplishment. Um, or just a thank you for no reason. You know, there's a comedian talks about the uh, just because just because cards. You can send that to, you know, he said buy 100 just because cards and send it out to the first 100 people in the phone book. He said they can't ask you why. It's just because you wanted to send them a card. But being able to just for absolutely no reason at all, just send them a card with a little bit of information in there and you know, it's easy to create those relationships with people. Um, so not only do we want to use our existing networks or get an opportunity to get people in that relationship, that close relationship with us, but to be able to reach the reachable people, since we never have an idea of who is actually reachable, who would actually listen to our presentation of the gospel, we must continually do the work of an evangelist. You know, that's one of the reasons why Paul says to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Continue doing that. Develop relationships with those people who are that cold market if you if you want to think of it that way that cold prospect somebody that you just meet figure out a way find out whether or not they're they're able to be able to reach to reach out to them in using every possible venue avenue whatever you want anything that we can do to get that cold cold market person that prospect into a warm market um, being able to distribute tracks, you know, get a set of tracks and take them out to people. Um, there was a young man a few weeks ago that I, that I read about. <clears throat> he went to post office and just set up a little table outside the post office handing out tracks. Uh, I mean, that's something anybody and everybody could do. I don't know, you might be able to do that at Walmart, just go out while, outside Walmart's door start handing out tracks to people. Um, got new neighbors, some sort of special meetings, things like that. Any way that you can contact anybody, um, develop those relationships to find out whether or not that they might be able to be a part of it. Um, even this, you know, if you got a friend um, that you might know that's you don't know if they're saved or not, invite them to this as we're going through the evangelism training. They might even learn something then. Another thing that we want to make sure <clears throat> that we know and understand and be, be mindful of is look for those seasons. There's seasons in everybody's life and every person that goes through that they're going to be especially open to the gospel. Normally this is in times of sickness or sorrow um, times of conviction for failure, for sin, um, times that they have some sort of loss or financial reversals or anything like that. Take the opportunity, you know, birth of a child. Take the opportunities that they're presented. Look for those opportunities. You know, you're not just always going to be having to just come up with things. I mean, there's, what, children born every five minutes or something like that, three minutes, two minutes, something like that. I mean, the, the, number, of, the number of children, when you, when you take those opportunities, take, a time, take the time to put those in there. Um, 
some of the things that I do want to mention to be mindful of. Don't have the wrong idea or the wrong attitude to farm. You're not, I don't want anybody to feel motivated to do this out of pressure, of guilt, which is why when we originally did this, I was like, I'm gonna, we're gonna meet one time and I'm gonna give everybody information and you go through it. Um, but I think what happened is, is there was some guilt that came out of that. Well, I'm not, I'm not on week four like I'm supposed to be and then we start feeling guilty. I don't want them, I don't want people to be motivated by guilt or shame or anything like that, but I want you to be empowered and motivated by the power of grace. Uh, don't expect, you know, you might meet one person and get them to come into the knowledge of the truth or get them to come to salvation. And then you go to another person, you get them, you're like, man, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. Don't expect abnormal things like that. You're not going to get every person. And just because you go, on, I mean, you might even go on a streak where the first 20 people just completely reject it and then you, you might get discouraged. Don't, don't expect ad, abnormal responses, things like that. Don't ever think that evangelism should focus primarily on strangers more than it does friends and family and things like that. Making sure that we keep our expectations where they should be. Okay. So we've got the definition of a farm. We've got an idea now how to develop the farm. Now it's keep the farm. Now one of the things you always have to deal with in a farm is there's bad things that's going to come along. It might be crows coming in trying to eat your corn. Uh, might be field mice. Might be some sort of whatever this beetle is that's eating up our crepe myrtle out here. You know, whatever it may be. Yeah, a little June bug. Whatever it may be, we have to we have to maintain it. So that's that's one reason why why we've got this this nest evangelism and ministry list, and I'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But maintaining files on people. If we talk to somebody, mark it down. You know, date and time, who they are, what sort of relationship you have with them. Was it a cold prospect? Was it a warm prospect? Prospect? Was it? family member do we have some sort of common interest as it a neighbor you know things like that uh, same job whatever it may be but keep keep uh, keep a file of those things start carrying around I know this Delilah had a little three by five book with the spiral bound on it the little note cards you know something like that keeping something like that and I'm, I'm not expecting people to go get Rolodexes and things like that uh, I mean, you've got stuff on your phone these days that you can keep all this information together. Um, know who they are, their name, address, the manner of their first con of, of your first contact. How was it? Did they, you know, did you all get along? Whatever it may be, their age, marital status, interest level, family members, whatever information. I mean, you, all this stuff is stuff that we do already. It's just taking the opportunities that's given to present the gospel to these people. You know, a lot of it, this stuff we can file back in our in our minds, especially if it's somebody that we know. But if it's somebody we don't, then we want to make sure that we maintain those records. Um, and there's there's a there's a little system. I mean, you can come up with however you want to, however you want to do this. Um, categorize the folks you know is it a family member common interest neighbor common vocation is it some sort of other contact uh, do we have they said they don't want any further contact with you <laughs> make sure you keep track of that because if you call them up one day and they've already cussed you upside one side and down the other you probably don't want to, you know, give them some space and things like that. You've, you've planted the seed, and that's the issue, right? Somebody else might come along and water, but they may just completely, you know, personalities may, may clash, and they just they don't want to have anything to do with you. Um, 
if there's a person who's willing to receive calls regularly, but they're not always open to the presentation of the gospel. A person that does receive the word gladly and, they, and that they don't mind being contacted all the time. And when you come to, when they actually come to a saving knowledge, being able to continue that relationship with them. You know, think of, think, you're going to, and as you go out and you do this, you're going to find out a lot, of, a lot more ways that you can go about doing that. Um, keeping a monthly activity log of who you've contacted. Did you present the gospel to that person? Or did you not? If you presented it, what was their response? You know, keep keeping track of that. Um, are they saved? Are they not saved? And you can, like I said, we can find out pretty quick within the first five minutes of a conversation with somebody whether or not they're saved or not. Um, are they churched? Do they go to church or not? This file that you create with all the names and address, all that stuff, that's your farm. And as you plant or as you water, God gives the increase. And what's going to happen as time goes on, you're going to see fruit that's harvested. And the next part would be the edification, right? So <clears throat> go real quick. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, we'll start there. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. That's the first part. And coming to the knowledge of the truth. Now, that's the same thing as when we started off, and we've always started off until tonight with Acts chapter 14. If you go to Acts chapter 14, it's the same issue that Paul's dealing with over here on his way to Derby. Right? He, he's stoned in chapter 13 or chapter 14, about halfway through, verse 19, verse 20. We see verse 19, he's left for dead. Verse 20, he gets up the next day and he goes, he goes with Barnabas to Derby. And verse 21, Acts chapter 14, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium. And, to, and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. As we go through this, when we evangelize the people, get them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the next thing is edification. Now, if you do not feel comfortable with the edification part, find out somebody that it is. You know, get them into something like this or get them into a local church if you have one. And if that doesn't work, you know, most everybody has, has the ability to do a three-way call on their phone. You know, cell phones are used to, I remember growing up, the, the phone that we had in the house. You had free local, but then you'd have to pay for long distance. Um, or you'd ha and then you'd have to pay for call waiting. And then you'd have to pay for three-way calling. And you'd have to pay for whatever it may be. Cell phones now, all that stuff's already bundled in and included with it. So you don't have to do anything extra. You have the ability to call up somebody and then bring in a third party and you all can have a conversation like that. Facebook gives you an opportunity to be able to do that. You can, you can bring somebody to the knowledge of the truth through Facebook conversations. Now, when we go through this, think about if you list uh, if you create a list of people that you know for certain that are unsaved, prioritize that list of the ones who are the most important to you. Then select those top seven and begin to plan and pray. That's the big thing. You know, we don't just go into this stuff willy-nilly and hoping everything works. But, and it's not just some business. And I, you know, sometimes it kind of feels that's, it's not some sort of business. But it's something that you have to think of it and think of it logically and put this stuff together in a certain way. 
and it may come off like that's what it is, but that's not, that's, that's not what it is at all. As we go through this, prioritize those folks and plan and pray for the strategy, the strategy to be able to reach them. It's not just something, like I said, we don't just go try it and just see what happens. Oh, well, and we go back to life. But pray about it. You know, that's one of those things as, as when you go through and you create this nest that we're going to talk about, the, the nest evangelism and the ministry list that we have, there's a little checklist. The very first thing is, do I pray, do I regularly pray for this person? Yes or no? Do I regularly share the gospel with this person? Yes or no? Do I regularly invite this person to a house fellowship? Yes or no? Does this person have any special needs or, or, or hurts? Is there something in their life that's messing things up for them? How can my health fellowship minister to this person? You know, and those, those are some of the things that we can think about. But as we build this farm, begin in this farm, think of any unsaved people that you know in your life and prioritize them. Select the, the top seven that you know that you have personal contacts with. Begin a plan and pray for them to be able to do that. You might be able to do this by memory but it's always it's always better to to think these things through friends family neighbors people you work with people you have some sort of relationship with your common interest um do you have you know there i'm kind of fortunate not everybody that i play disc golf with is saved um but there's there's a pretty good group of guys that that i know are and having con con conversation with them is a with them about that from time to time is always, you know, we've, we've got something in common. We've already got some sort of relationship that we can build off of that. Uh, do you have a Christmas card list? Have you been invited to a wedding? Are you having a wedding? You know, do you have an attorney? Talk to them. Everybody knows attorneys need. <laughs> um, your dentist, doctors, chiropractors, small business owners, People you used to go to school with, people you used to go to church with, um, salespeople, any 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 time any sort of situation, Jehovah's Witness. When they come knocking on your door, don't hide. Open up the door and and present the gospel to them. They're going to find out pretty quick that they're not saved. You know, it's always funny. One guy knows some stuff, and the other guy's training. I think that's what I've kind of noticed in in conversations with them. Um, don't hide from them. Invite them in. Show them the verses which says that Jesus Christ and God are, are the same and, and, and we can you know move on from there. Find out whether or not that person is saved. So here's our, here's our let's do this. Let me find something real quick. <clears throat> um, here's our homework. I'm going to find something real quick on my phone. <clears throat> so here's your homework. Number one, organize your farm file. Identify the seven people that you know for a fact are not saved <clears throat> and they need to hear the gospel. Now that's warm prospects, people that you know, right? The second thing is to set up appointments to meet with those people that you've list that you've listed in your homework number one assignment. Now, if you don't remember homework number one, um, that was the fourth part of the assignment of, of number one was make a list of unsaved people with whom you have a relationship with. So that's something that we've already done. So all we're doing is we're taking that list and moving forward. Um, these appointments are for the purpose of sharing the gospel and using the method that we've already learned. And if you're not sure what we've learned, go back and watch the videos and go through that, through that again. You know, asking people to crunch questions, getting, getting it into, into you, ingrained in your mind to be able to think about how am I going to be able to speak to this person? All right. Um, homework number three, and I kind of, I don't. I, I probably shouldn't do this, but I don't really care. I'm going to anyway. 
it's it's out there if anybody wants it anyway so here we go if if you would like me to have a conversation with anybody here's the number you can contact me on it's 502 249 8034 that's 502 249 8034 if you have somebody that you want to have a conversation with that, that that you want me to be able to have a conversation with that's the phone number that you can reach us at is 502-249-8034 if we do not answer. That's our, That's our Crosswork Ministries phone number. If no one answers, please leave a message. Um, whether it's with their name and their phone number, however we can get in contact with them, um, let us know. Okay. So 502-249-8034. That's our Crosswork Ministries phone number um, here in Frankfurt. But <clears throat> if you have if you have any contact or anybody that you need to have contact with, if you would like us to speak with them. Now, of course, the problem with that is for you is we don't have that connection that you do, right? Uh, so keep that in mind. Now, on the, and I want to end off with this, and again, I know you can't read it, but if you've got the, if you've got the PDF, uh, you do have this, and I might go ahead and, like I did last time, snap a picture of it or upload it somehow uh, so you can see it. So as you go through, being able to figure out, being able to put names, addresses, uh, phone numbers, and go through the checklist as we go through. And as I said, the, the, the grouping is family, common interest, neighbor, common vocation, or other contact. And then the checklist is, do I pray for this person often? Do I share the gospel regularly? Do I regularly invite them to our house fellowship? Um, does this person have special needs or hurts? And how can I make, how can my house fellowship and minister to this person? I mean, if all this fails, pick a night and have friends and family over. Let them know this is what we're going to do and have conversations with them that way. Uh, but you've got a checklist on the front and then a little contact log on the back to be able to make sure that you keep up with them. Um, why you contacted them, how you contacted them, did you visit them, did you write them a letter, did you give them a phone call, whatever it may be. All right. So, <clears throat> we've got one lesson left to do. Now, we've crammed eight lessons into ten if we can get this one done next week. That's pretty good for us, I'm not going to lie. I was kind of worried. We was going to end up with 16 of these. Um, so the next one that we're going to have, we're going to finish up. And what that's going to be is learning to look beyond the church walls. Now, one of the things that I will mention <clears throat> is um, if you have a local church, don't always assume just because somebody's in that local church that they're saved. Okay, So keep that, keep that in mind. The, you know, everybody's idea is, well, if we get them to church, then we can present the gospel, and then they can get saved, and then we can move on from there. Now, evangelism takes place outside. Now, can people be evangelized inside the church? Absolutely. You know, you can have unsaved people come in, or people that's gone to the church for years come in one day, and they hear the gospel, and they decide, they decide hey, I'm not really saved because I've put my faith in something else. Um, edification is taking place in the church should be now of course evangelism can but evangelism really takes place outside of the church so next week we'll talk about learning to look beyond the church walls now if you've got people that come into church take advantage of that opportunity but um, I've enjoyed this series and we're not even finished yet but I've enjoyed it um, so we'll see what happens so it's a little bit past eight so we're going to go ahead and finish up, and uh, we'll finish these up next week. So thank you all for watching. Again, I'll check later if anybody has questions or comments or anything like that. I can't look and see until after we're finished. So.
Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you all Sunday morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we have a clear and a more concise understanding of how to present your word, how to create that form, and then do the work of, of an evangelist, and just get to work. You know, we were talking on Sunday mornings about the gifts and things like that, but it's just get to doing what God's got us to do, and that's to get people saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. But Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to do this, that we might be able to glorify your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>